Y'all ready to get into scripture here together today? Hey, if this is your first time, we're super glad you're here. Can we show our new friends some love? Genesis Church. <clears throat> my name is Josh. I get to pastor this church with my wife, Carly. And um, we're just going to get into it. If you came prepared with your tithe and offering, it's one of the ways we worship God around here. And you came with cash or check. Our ushers at the end of our service will be at the doors. You can sow there. Many of you have given online already. GenesisSpokane.com slash give. They're giving me a note on the prompter. Um, so far this year, uh, we're only three weeks into the year, four weeks almost into the year. Genesis, and you fed 80 people in Spokane through your partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank. It's one of our local outreaches, and we do that through our Connect cards. Uh, that's just a, a few pieces of information. If you're blessed here at all today, if God moves in your heart, um, and you're thinking about wanting some more information or just like, what is this thing all about? Um, we would love to get some information from you so we can reach out. Someone's going to give you a call. They're going to pray for you on the phone should you request it. Um, somebody will email you, and we're not going to just spam you like crazy. It's because we want to get to know you. This is a family, and uh, it's crazy like your family, and it's wild like your family. And uh, you probably don't like everybody in this room, just like your family. Come on, let's tell the truth in church. But uh, every Connect card um, will feed a family of five on your behalf. So this, far, this, this, this year so far, Genesis Church, 80 people that you have fed in this city. God's good. I'm thankful for a generous house. God, I pray. I'm thankful for all the provision that you give to us. I pray that as we remain faithful to worship you and to obey out of a heart and a spirit of gratitude and generosity as we obey financially and worship financially, God, that you would continue to increase the resources of the people in this church, increase their influence, bring supernatural opportunities so that through us, as you say in Deuteronomy, through us, your covenant would be established on this earth. We love you and pray you're glorified in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. And as we jump into scripture, one more thing like we like to do. Can we welcome all of our friends who are joining us online through that camera lens right there? <clears throat> We're glad you're here. We're just going to jump into scripture. I got a message for you today titled, The Reason for Revelation. Somebody say, The Reason for Revelation. And we're just going to jump into scripture, the text for our talk here today is John chapter 11. We're going to read 44 verses from Scripture today. I'm reading from the ESV. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, it'll be up above my head on the sky. But you can follow along there. John chapter 11 says this. And now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. You know Mary and Martha in Scripture where Jesus shows up to their house and and uh, he's a great friend of theirs, and so he's, he's, he's in their living room, and Martha's freaking out, running around, trying to get dinner ready. And Mary is just sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha's like, would you tell my sister, my lazy sister Mary, to get up here and help me make some sandwiches? And Jesus tells Martha, hey, Mary has chosen the, the, the good thing. It's that Mary and Martha. And chapter 2 says this, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. This guy Lazarus, great friend of Jesus. Jesus loves him. He's ill. And Scripture makes sure, and the Apostle John makes sure to tell us that the one who was sick was the brother uh, of the one who anointed Jesus' feet with oil and wept on him. It, it, it makes a point to tell us. You ever felt like God owed you something? The reason for revelation. You ever felt like God owed you something? When we act like God owes us something, we do, we do weird stuff. We feel like, God, I deserve this. God, you should have. God, why didn't you? And we walk around with the spirit of God owing me something. And before we get too holy, let's, let's examine ourselves and ask, are there areas where I feel like God owes me something? God, I've served. God, is it okay if we just jump right into the message here? Like no intro, no funny stories. We just jump into scripture. Like God, like God, I feel like you owe me. I've served. I gave. You ever feel like God owed you something? It makes us do funny stuff. It makes, us, it makes us angry at God because God didn't come through when he owed us. We did all the things we were supposed to do. 
You know, so many things that happen to us, so many oppositions in life, so many storms that we see in Scripture that we go through are not a function of disobedience or bad decisions. Sometimes it's just a function of life. And sometimes when you're making all the right decisions and you're doing everything God asked you to do, you, you, the opposition still comes. If I'm honest, those are the ones I have trouble with. When I did something stupid, you ever done something stupid and you had to pay the consequences? One person raised their hand. The rest of y'all are liars. <laughs> See, those ones, those scenarios are far easier for me than, than, than when I feel like I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. And still, the thing that I'm looking for, that I'm looking toward, that I'm praying for isn't showing up. You ever felt like God owed you something? I think it's interesting that, that John, the, the Apostle John, what we have to remember about this gospel is it's one of the last books of the Bible written. Even though it shows up as the fourth in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels because they share so many stories together and they were written around the same time. John's gospel comes some 30 years later when the apostle John is an old man, exiled on the island of Patmos. He won't stop preaching. So they go, we're going to put you on an island so you can't preach. He goes, fine, I'll write it down. And he gives us the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and, and his vision of, of the apocalypse, the book of Revelation. And so he's writing these to add a piece to us, not, not because Matthew, Mark, and Luke were, were, were wrong. He just wanted to add a piece of Jesus' character that he knew to be true. And we get stories in the Gospel of John that, that show up nowhere else. And John needs us to know the one who is sick is one of Jesus' best friends. It's the one where, where he was blessed by, by uh, Mary ministering to him and weeping on him and pouring out expensive perfume upon him. You ever felt like God owed you something? It makes us act silly. Feeling like God owes you something is poison in your spirit. Yeah. It's such a free place to live knowing that anything that I have from God is, is, is a free gift of his goodness and his grace and his nature that I, in fact, God owes me nothing. He didn't owe me the cross. He didn't owe me Jesus. He didn't owe me sending his only begotten son to be falsely accused and punished and tortured and humiliated on that cross. He didn't owe that to me, but still in his goodness, he gave it to me and he gave it to you. And everything else is just icing on the cake. But since we feel like God owed us stuff, let's keep reading. So the sisters sent to him. You know how I know that that was a reason? Because John says, so. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with wine and wiped his feet with the hair of his brother Lazarus. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. It's a huge scriptural motif that God will be glorified yeah. in every situation, in every scenario. I love that we get front row seats to see how God is going to be glorified in impossible situations. One of my favorite things to pray is, God, I don't know how you're going to get glory from this, but I know that you are. And I'm excited that I get front row seats to see that the God who said that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he holds the universe in his hands, even though this looks contrary and, 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 and the exact opposite of what I thought you might will, when I'm seeing this and I'm watching this, I know that you're going to get glory from it. Verse 5 says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And this is not just the kind of love with which he loved the whole world. He loved them. They were close to him. They were dear friends of his. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, this is wild. He loved them so much. So when he heard he was sick, he stayed two days in the place that he was. 
Move me. He stayed two days in that place. And then after he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. You ever feel like God owed you something? You ever feel like God didn't show up in your time frame? I know that's like, a, that's like an easy, low-hanging fruit preacher question. But when we feel like God owes us stuff, we get timelines. Isn't it wild that Scripture says he loved them so much that he waited for two days? Some of y'all are looking for a reason why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. And listen, this is not just like a difficult situation. This is an impossible situation. Impossible. He's dead. Impossible. This is not like, hey, I'm having a rough week. I'm talking about this is the thing that, that is gut-wrenching, that you can feel it in your soul. Have you ever faced something where, it, like, when you thought about it, it took your breath away? It was like jumping in to the deep end of a freezing cold pool that you didn't ask for and you didn't create it. None of them asked for this. This is not just, I did stupid, and so now I'm reaping stupid consequences. It was thrust upon them. The scripture says that he loved them so much, he waited. You and I, we don't have context for that in our definition of love. If we were writing this, it would be Jesus loved them so much that he sprinted there with open arms saying, I'll never leave you and never forsake you. But scripture says, and John needed us, the one who understood God's love more than any of the other apostles. John needed us to know this about God's love. He loved them so much, he waited. Two days later, dead, two days later, he says, let's go to Judea again. So John chapter 10 tells us, and John, in fact, John chapter 8 and 9 and 10 give us all different scenarios of the Jews trying to kill Jesus. And so scripture says that he went across the Jordan to the place where John, this is the end of chapter 10, he went across the Jordan to where John was baptizing and many were coming to him. People send word that one of his best friends is dead. And he says, okay, guys, time to go back to Judea. In chapter 8, this is funny. The disciples said to him, uh, Rabbi, point of order. Let me remind you, uh, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And you're going to And you're going to go there? Can we go there for a sec? He's like, the, the disciples are like, no, 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 no. We, we cannot go there because they're trying to kill you. And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? He's talking about the daylight. Because people were like, I think there's 24 Eesh. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. What a weird response. What a weird response. Hey, Jesus, uh, remember the bad guys are there? And he's in, in response to that question, he says, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble. This is in response to the fact that there are people that want to kill you, Jesus. I know your friend is there, but there are people that want to kill you. If he walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. He's using words of light and awakening and enlightening. Here's my assertion. The reason he waited was because he loved them so much that more than a reason for why this happened, he wanted to give them a revelation of who he was. Some of us are looking for reasons. God, would you give me a reason? If I could just know, 
If I could just know why you asked me to do this, God, then maybe I would. If I could just understand, then I'd obey. But so often in Scripture, understanding follows obedience. We obey God's word and we do what he says. And then we understand eight years later when we saw all the things that God could see then orchestrated and coming together. And more than a reason, here's what I'm going to argue. God sometimes gives reasons, but he will always, if you obey, give you revelation. And we're obsessed with reasons. God, tell me why. Help me understand. But more than a reason, he wants to give you a revelation. Every miracle that God does for us is not just for the sake of the miracle. It's to unveil and reveal a piece of his character and nature. It's one thing for God to provide food for 5,000 people on a hillside. It's another thing for him to reveal his nature as provider. You're praying for provision. And he wants to give you a revelation that he is provider. And so maybe the provision you prayed for didn't show up when it did because you would get obsessed with the provision and not the provider. You would get obsessed with the healing and not the healer. And more than a reason, more than a miracle, God is not into magic tricks. He is into using scenarios and situations to reveal his character to you. Jesus says he's fallen asleep. He says, he says y'all are walking in the dark. Jesus, don't you know they want to kill you? He's like, oh man, y'all are walking in the dark. But I'm about to shine a light on a piece of my nature and my character that you have not seen because thus far they had known him as healer. They had not seen him as resurrector. And so because he loved them, he waited. Oh, we hate that. Because when we feel like God owes us things, we get timelines. And God will jack with your timeline to reveal who he is. This is frustrating, right? Are you sufficiently frustrated yet? You're like, I th- your friend told you you're going to be encouraged when you come to this church? It's going to be fun. I just have to say what I feel like the Holy Spirit told me to say to us, even if we listen to it like this. Jesus says, oh, no, man, he fell asleep. I'm about to go awaken him. And the disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. How often we misunderstand what it is that God is saying to us because we have our own filters and we have our own boxes and our own assumptions of what's possible in God because thus far they had not seen Jesus as a resurrecting God. And so the only context they had was Jesus, the healing God, which is not wrong. It was just incomplete. He was yet to reveal this part of his nature. So all the reasons they were looking for would have been insufficient anyway because they hadn't had a revelation of this piece of who he was. And so maybe the reason that you are looking for is not coming and the answer you're asking for is not coming because you're looking in the wrong box and you're opening the wrong closet because you haven't seen this piece of God's nature revealed. And so he is waiting because he wants to reveal something about himself that you have not yet known. And and this is frustrating. (laughs) You know what? I don't even know what you're supposed to do with this message. I like preaching the the message that has a practical handle. I just felt like the Lord, as I was praying this morning, he said, speak to the eternal things. Here's my notes for today. Speak to the eternal things. And there's two other lines that I already said. (laughs) 
Speak to the eternal things. Because I can feed the temporal and I can feed the practical. And that's all good and well. But you didn't come here to get a self-help message. You didn't come here to get a six ways to help God get on your timeline. Whether you know it or not, what you needed was a revelation of the eternal God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And who never changes. And so maybe you showed up for one thing. But I felt like the Holy Spirit told me, speak to the eternal. Because it starts to awaken something on the inside of you. I didn't come here today to give you a spiritual ambient pill. I came here to incite a riot in your spirit that there would be chaos on the inside and it would flip upside down who you thought God was so that you would pursue the provider. So Jesus tells him plainly. He goes, yo, he's dead. like well Jesus if he's asleep because because they had seen this piece of his character and, and the piece of his character that had been revealed to them thus far would make sense to say well if he's only sleeping he's going to recover and you just got to do the thing and you got to do the blow and then he's okay but but Jesus goes no 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 he is dead and then Jesus says one of the one of the most jerk lines in all of scripture and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. Thomas, Peter, James, John, we're going to Judea. Aren't they trying to kill you? Yo, you walk in the darkness. Like, I'm about to reveal, so I'm about to awaken something. Well, if he's sleeping, he's like he's just going to be, no, 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 he's dead. He's dead. And then he looks his best friends in the eyes and says, and for your sake, he goes, you know what? Matter of fact, for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. This doesn't, this doesn't fit into the picture of who you are, Jesus. You're the healer. For, for your sake, I'm glad. For your sake, I'm glad I waited. For your sake, I'm glad I wasn't on your timeline. For your sake, I'm glad it took longer than you thought it should. For your sake. Whoa, I thought you loved me. I do. And because I love you, I'm waiting. Mm. Holy Spirit, help me. For your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. Because I'm, I'm about to reveal a piece of me that you have not seen yet. And you have no way of knowing what is about to come. And so for your sake, I'm glad I didn't do your thing on your timeline. Because my thing on my timeline is far better. And you didn't even know to ask for it. And our, Come on, somebody needs to just praise God and thank God for all the unanswered prayers. For all the ways that he didn't come through on your timeline and in your way. Because he was orchestrating things 30 years down the timeline that you would have been seven years ahead of if he came through on your timeline and you have no idea of knowing what is coming because you don't know to ask for it because you ain't never seen it. So that you may believe. But let's go to him. And I love this. This, one, this cracks me up. So Thomas, called the twin, he looks around the rest of the disciples and he goes, well, I guess we're going to go too so that we can die with them. Because they're like, Jesus, we can't go back. The Jews are trying to kill you. He's like, well, I'm going. He's like, well, freak. I guess I'm going too. And we're all going to die. <laughs> are you thankful that God allows you on his team, even when you don't understand the outcome, even when you feel like following Jesus is going to kill you? You ever felt like following Jesus was going to cost you everything? Because it does. You ever felt like it was going to kill you? You ever felt like it was going to kill you socially? To actually step out into the fullness of what God has for you is going to make you look like a crazy person. And all the clout that you've worked for is going to evaporate in 17 seconds. The perfectly curated picture you had of yourself. He's like, well, I guess if I follow Jesus, I'm going to die. You just better get a revelation that following Jesus means you're going to die anyway. We die to self. We die to our flesh so that we can come alive in Christ. Let's go too so that we could die. Dear Jesus, I have six and a half minutes to get through a thousand scriptures. <laughs> now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. It's important in the Jewish mind because they believed that the spirit of the dead person floated around for three days. 
By the fourth day, they were actually dead. So this is like dead, dead. Not like a sleep dead. It's like dead, dead. Like D-E-D, dead. Like dead, dead. Like there's hope for day one, two, three. Day four, eh, he did. So Jesus waited two days because he loved them. Because he loved them, he jacked with their timeline. Because he loved them, he messed with what they thought was possible. Because why? Because, because, because any time that we would start to worship the miracle more than the miracle worker, I truly believe this, that God will withhold the miracle to reveal his nature and his character. And if we're not careful, we get so obsessed with the things that God will do for us that we totally forget that the point of those things is to reveal a piece of his nature to you and I. And more, more than a miracle, I need a revelation of who God is. He was dead four days. Dead, dead. Somebody say dead, dead. Like dead, dead. And scripture says, Bethany was near Jerusalem about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained. She remained seated in the house. In verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, ooh, if you had been here, if you loved me, if you cared, if you really knew what I was going through, if you had been here, can you remember how much Jesus loves Mary and Martha? And the reason he stayed away two days was because he loved them. The reason he showed up here was to reveal a piece of his nature. Can you imagine how this must have felt for Jesus to hear? If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. The one that you love, you know how much you love him? If you would have been here. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And she gets all eschatological on him. No, I know, like, that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Because she had, she had a revelation of that. She had a box for that. She had context for that. Oh, no, I know, I know, I know, I know. How many times do, do we miss what God is trying to say to us because we're not listening and allowing him to stretch our context? And the miracles that God does so often is, is, for, is for a far bigger reason than the miracle itself. It's to stretch our context of what he thought was possible. And maybe they had a box for it. It was possible for him to come back to life on day one, two, or three, but not day four. He says, I, she, here's, here's if we can read the subtext. I know you're the healer. And so even though he was sick, if you had been here, you could have touched him. He would have been whole because she had context for that. But Jesus seems to communicate, it was for your sake that I didn't come on your timeline. And that's frustrating. So Jesus said to her, no, 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 I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And when she had said this, when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private. So she sends somebody to Mary in private, saying, teacher, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, this is Mary. Remember, Martha's the one who was all busy, and Martha's the one that runs to Jesus, and Mary sat in the house. They're the same people. It's the same thing. They're just doing what they know how to do. They're just trying to survive because their brother's dead. But she hears that the teacher is calling. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. And now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but he was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. And when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him a very familiar phrase, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
you got to be careful the company you keep when your timeline's messed up. You could tell that Mary and Martha had a conversation about this. If Jesus had been here, our brother would be alive. Because Martha says it to him when she gets there, and then the first thing Mary says when she gets there is what they discuss behind the scenes. you got to be careful who you allow to speak into your life and speak into your world. You better hope that they have a revelation of the goodness of God and a revelation of the authority of God and a revelation of the trustworthiness of God. Because if you get around the wrong people, they will affirm the wrong things. And it seems like advice, and it seems helpful. But when, they, when she got there, she said the same thing Martha said. Some of y'all, you, 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 God is off your timeline right now. And you got to be careful the company that you're keeping. Because, because, some of, because the wrong people will affirm the wrong things. And they will keep the wrong things alive in you. And they will stoke the wrong flames. And they will stoke the wrong fires. And they will say, yeah, he has been kind of dumb for three years. You should leave him. You're right. Yeah, God hasn't come through. See, I told you, I walked away from that eight years ago because I knew that God wasn't real. you got to be careful the company that you keep when, you, when God is off your timeline because the wrong people will affirm the wrong things. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. I don't know if you got a study Bible. But most of your study Bibles will note when it says deeply moved, that the Greek word means indignant. He was indignant. He was angry. When he saw them weeping, it moved him. He was indignant, and his spirit was greatly troubled. More than just the compassion of Jesus, he was frustrated and upset that they didn't understand this piece of who he was. And he was frustrated at, 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 the, at the sin of the world and the fall of man, that we had forgotten the, the revelation of the nature of who God was. And he was greatly troubled, and he said, okay, fine, it's time now. Where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And verse 35 says, Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? You've got to be careful the company you keep when, you, when God is off of your timeline. When you feel like God owes you something. Are the people in your world speaking scripture? Are they speaking the nature and the character of God? Or are they allowing themselves to be dragged down into the understanding of the circumstances and to be influenced by what they see with their natural eyes rather than what Hebrews 11 tells us that Abram had the eyes of faith and he could see forward to a city with foundations though he lived in the desert in tents. I'm, just try, I'm speaking to the eternal. I don't even know what you're going to do with this. And then Jesus, indignant again, came to the tomb. And it was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the busy one, she's like, Lord, by this time there's going to be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. Have you ever disobeyed God because you didn't have context for what he was asking you to do? And I wonder how many times God's asked me to do something. I've been like, God, I don't think you understand the scenario. And God goes, would you just do what I said? I'm trying to reveal a piece of who I am to you. He's been dead four days. And Jesus said, didn't I tell you if you believed? Notice what he doesn't say, that you would see a resurrection. What does he say? You would see the glory of God. Let us remember, friends. The miracles that you experience in your life are always to reveal the glory of God. It's about a revelation of who he is. Let us not be the people that get so obsessed with the miracle and the breakthrough and the promise and the progress and the timeline that we miss what God is trying to reveal about himself. He loved them so much he waited. Do you have context for the waiting in your life as, as, as a revelation of God's love for you. He's like, God, I want you to get obsessed with the thing that I'm going to do. I want you to be obsessed with who I am. 
Not the provision. I want you to be obsessed with the fact that I'm provider. Not the healing. I want you to be obsessed with the fact that I am healer. Not the fact that I defended you. I want you to be obsessed with the fact that I am defender. Every miracle, it reveals a piece of the nature and glory of God. And if we miss that part, then maybe just maybe God will withhold things on your timeline. And maybe your theology doesn't have room for that, but let it be stretched by John chapter 11. God will wait because he loves you. Because you're looking for the wrong things in the wrong places. Sometimes God gives us a reason, even though we don't like it. The reason was, is I was going to reveal my glory. Well, that doesn't help my dead brother. Take away the stone, and Martha said, it's going to stink. And Jesus said to her, I told you, if you believed, you'd see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth, Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Unbind him and let him go. Holy Spirit, I pray I pray that you would unbind our eyes unbind our hearts I'm asking that in your grace and sovereignty that you would untether our expectations from outcomes unbind us God let us be those that even when fear might be present, that we would step out on a word and obey. God, give us eyes to see beyond the miracle to a revelation of your nature and your character. God, there are people in this room who have experienced miracles in the last decade. Help them see beneath the miracle to the deeper part of the revelation of your character. God, help them to see beyond the provision, to see the provider. Help them see beyond their physical wholeness. Help them see their healer. God, that we would be those that reflect your life and your nature and your character. God, help us to abandon our timelines. Help us to to walk that narrow path of faith and expectation without being tied to a timeline. God, for the people who are in the waiting for your your off their timeline, God, give them wisdom and discernment about the people that they're allowing to speak into their hearts and into their world. God, send them people who are so full of the word of God and full of faith and full of expectation that they would not be shaken in their faith. But God, their faith would be strengthened in the waiting. We love you and pray you're glorified here today in Jesus' name. Genesis Church said, amen. Can we stand together, church? God is good and he's faithful. Maybe you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I wouldn't consider myself a Christian. I would consider myself somebody that follows Jesus. I want to give you the opportunity to follow Jesus here today, to receive him as Lord and Savior. This is a decision that we make in that we have the agency of free will, but more than anything, it's just receiving the miracle that happened 2,000 years ago. 
The scripture says that if we would just believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that we will be saved. And so we're going to pray here together. I'm going to invite each of us into this moment of prayer. I'm going to invite each of us to pray this. And those of you who have prayed this before, we're just joining our faith with those who are praying this for the first time. This is a big deal. It's a big step. Many of you have wrestled for weeks, months, years. You've refused to be caught up in a moment. You've engaged your intellect. You've studied. You've read. You're ready to make a decision. Many of you, the Holy Spirit is drawing you in this moment, and you're making a decision to make Jesus Lord of your life and to give him lordship, to follow him wherever he goes and do whatever he says, which to people obsessed with control is a scary proposition. (laughs) But it's the best life. I promise you, you're trying to find your best life, this is it. So as the Holy Spirit is beckoning us to the Father through the Son, I would ask that if we could just all of us bow our heads in this room and close our eyes together, would you just repeat after me? And if you're praying this for the first time or for the first time again, would you just incline your heart to the Father and pray in faith and say this. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I know that I've sinned and I need you. Come into my world. Be my leader. Be my Lord. I believe that you rose from the dead so that I could have brand new life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use my life to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis Church.